Hello. The following is an overview of USDA's US Domestic Hemp Production Program. My name is Bill Richmond. I am the chief of the program at USDA. And before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to the USDA uh, program, hemp program staff. Um, these are the folks that help us administer the program here at USDA. And these are the individuals that you will be in contact with that will be able to help you, to help explain the requirements of the program and to help you with um, issues such as um, reporting data, um, clarifying questions, or any help you may need related to the program. These are the folks that will be able to help you. So these individuals are Jamika Henderson, Fiona Pexton, Emily Feblis, Rebecca Engel, Kate Tantakis, Vicki Felder, and Graham Davis. The topics that we are going to cover during the webinar are as follows. We're going to provide a brief overview of the 2014 and 2018 farm bills. We are going to talk <clears throat> a little bit about the interim final rule and then cover the fundamental differences between the interim final rule and the final rule. We're going to discuss what is not changing from the interim final rule. We're going to talk about the requirements for state and tribal hemp production plans. We're going to cover FSA reporting, lab requirements, sampling agents, and then talk a little bit about some of the timelines moving forward and follow it up at the end with providing some more contact information. So to begin, the 2014 Farm Bill was the action that gave State Departments of Agriculture and Institutes of Higher Education the ability to create pilot programs, primarily for research purposes, to study the growth, cultivation, or marketing of industrial hemp. Now, in the 14 Farm Bill, there was a requirement that the THC concentration for industrial hemp had to be less than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. The 2014 Farm Bill did not remove industrial hemp from the controlled substances list. And the bill really was the effort to uh, restart the growth of hemp in the United States. Um, and I think that was demonstrated fairly quickly after the passage of the bill, uh, given that more than 40 states ultimately ended up creating pilot programs to study hemp. So fast forward to the 2018 Farm Bill. This was passed in uh, December of 2018. The action decoupled hemp for marijuana and formally established that hemp is not a Schedule One drug and removed hemp from the Controlled Substances Act. The bill also required that USDA develop a program to review and approve hemp plans submitted by states and Indian tribes and to also establish a USDA oversight program for individuals in states or in those tribal territories that did not want to administer their own independent programs. Quickly following issuance of the 2018 Farm Bill, USDA published an interim final rule now, this document was the first set of regulatory requirements governing all aspects of hemp production in the United States, particularly around uh, concentration limits for THC, 
what to do if there is a violation. It included requirements for sampling, testing, reporting, and general oversight for USDA and also for state and tribal governments. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of these specific requirements um, moving forward. So following issuance of the interim final rule, USDA immediately began outreach efforts with states and Indian tribes, also with individual hemp producers, working to help establish state and tribal hemp production programs, and also issuing licenses to those individual growers in states and in those tribes who were not administering their own hemp production programs. We were also working on collecting input on the program so that we could ultimately issue a final rule. The ways that we did this was by following issuance of the interim final rule, we opened up comment periods where hemp industry stakeholders and the public could submit comments to USDA to provide insight on what they liked about the interim final rule, what they did not like about the interim final rule, and to give USDA suggestions on the best path moving forward, and to let us know the types of requirements that we should include in the final um, regulatory document. So, the interim final rule was open for 90 days. There were several different reopened comment periods, and we ultimately received nearly 6,000 comments from stakeholders. The bulk of these comments did come from individual hemp producers, but we also received significant input from state and tribal governments, Indian, or, uh, industry groups, industry attorneys, many, many others in, this, in the hemp uh, community. And we wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone for submitting comments to USDA and participating in the rulemaking process. It is incredibly helpful and incredibly insightful to us when working through rulemaking efforts. I wanted to take a brief moment to mention that there, throughout the course of this rulemaking process, there were two extensions for states that were operating 2014 Farm Bill hemp pilot programs. Um, the first one extended the authority out until September 30th, 2021. And this was actually followed up by another extension, which gave states the ability to administer pilot programs out until uh, the end of 2021. Just a little more detail on what these extensions provided. They basically gave states the ability to continue to administer their 2014 Farm Bill compliant programs uh, a little bit longer than they had initially been allowed. And it ultimately gave states a little bit more time to work to develop their state specific hemp programs to align better with the requirements in the 2018 Farm Bill. The other piece of this I wanted to mention is that during this process, some states at the moment, it is New Hampshire, Hawaii, and Mississippi, have elected to not administer state level hemp programs. And these are examples of um, states where USDA provides the licensing services for individuals that want to grow hemp. Okay, and just a, a little more on outreach and some of the feedback we received. 
As I mentioned, we had incredible participation in the rulemaking process. We received around 6,000 comments. Um, another piece of the rulemaking effort that I wanted to mention was just around some of the outreach that USDA accomplished. We held hundreds of meetings with different stakeholder groups throughout the final rule development process. We held several formal listening sessions with Indian tribes and with other groups. Again, multiple meetings in different conferences. And we really took the input and feedback to heart from the industry when we were working to develop the final rule. Okay, now we are going to get into some of the nuts and bolts um, in, regarding the content of the final rule. And the way that we are going to do that is to cover some of the differences between the interim final rule and the final rule. So the first change we wanted to mention is an increase in the harvest window. This is the time period that producers have between when a sample is collected at their farm and when they have to complete their harvest. In the interim final rule, this requirement was 15 days. Now in the final rule, we have doubled that window from 15 days to 30 days. This was the result of significant feedback from stakeholders. Basically, we heard the message loud and clear that this harvest window was too short of a time period and too, diff too difficult to meet, which led us to increase the number of days. The next change I wanted to mention was regarding the increase in the threshold for um, what we describe as a negligent violation. So under the Farm Bill, there were specific actions that are considered to be negligent. Examples of those types of actions include growing hemp over the acceptable uh, hemp THC level, not reporting certain information, um, instances uh, such as those two. In the interim final rule, we also had a requirement that said that if a producer grows hemp with a THC concentration over 0.5%, it would be considered a negligent violation. In the interim final rule, we have now doubled that negligence threshold for THC from 0.5 to 1.0. It's important to remember that this threshold does not impact the, um, the need to destroy or remediate a crop. Um, it strictly has to do with whether or not a producer receives a negligent violation. Hemp over 0.3% is still considered to be marijuana and does still need to be destroyed. We will talk a little bit more about some of the options that the options for growers that the final rule now includes when the first initial hemp uh, THC test comes back over 0.3%. So this is an excellent segue into some of these other remediation options um, for when test results come back over 0.3%. In the interim final rule, we said that if a test result comes back above 0.3, the entire product associated with that test, um, the entire lot of hemp needed to be destroyed. There were not any other options um, 
outside of destruction. <clears throat> so now in the final rule, the option to remediate this type of material exists. So what this means is that after the initial test is returned to a producer that is above 0.3%, they have several options um, to potentially remediate that material and to reduce the THC concentration. The first option is to blend up the entire material and create a biomass type product. This is the picture on the right side of the screen. When we say chop up, we mean not just the flower, not just the buds. Um, this is combining the entire plant, stalks, leaves, seeds, stems, into a combined homogenous shredded material, which is then resampled and retested for compliance. The other option is to completely remove the flowers, destroy the flowers, and retain stalks, leaves, seeds, stems, any of the residual material. Um, and then that leftover material, since the flowers have been removed, and um, of course where THC is concentrated in the flowers, um, the residual stalk material can enter the stream of commerce. One important point is that when a producer decides to pursue remediation, there is a requirement that the remediated material be resampled and retested for THC compliance. So if the result of that test is returned within a compliant range, meaning less with less than 0.3 THC, then it is allowed to enter into the stream of commerce. It can be sold and it does not need to be destroyed. I want to point everybody to the USDA hemp program website. We have a document on the website that we issued along with the final rule entitled Remediation and Disposal Guidelines. This is the document where we explain these different options and talk through some of the recommended logistics on how to uh, work through a remediation process on the farm. Additionally, the final rule provided for some more options for disposal of hot crops on the farm. In the interim final rule, we had a requirement that said anytime a um, non-compliant test was returned to a producer, the material had to be destroyed using a DEA reverse distributor. This requirement was quickly relaxed following issuance of the interim final rule. Um, and we allowed for on-farm disposal to occur on the farm on an interim basis. The final rule has now provided a permanent allowance uh, for on-farm disposal in the instance of a non-compliant test. What this means is that if a producer elects to not pursue a remediation strategy as previously discussed, or following remediation, the test still comes back non-compliant and that remediated materials are uh, in process remediated material, if you will, still needs to be destroyed, they are able to destroy it on the farm. So using the example of crops that are still in the ground, the producer can now use a mulcher, a shredder, they can cut the plants down, burn them, bury them, a variety of traditional on-farm um, 
disposal practices exists now that farmers can utilize when working through a uh, disposal type situation. The next item has to do with the requirement in the interim final rule that all laboratories testing hemp had to be registered with DEA. The final rule did not remove this requirement, but what it did do is extend the deadline for laboratories to work through the DEA lab registration process out until December 31st, 2022. The final rule includes some significant flexibilities for research. Under the final, under the interim final rule, we did not include specific requirements for a significant sector of the hemp industry participating in either university sponsored research or third party sponsored research as it relates to genetics, um, compliant hemp varietals, and all types of research being done in the hemp community. The final rule now provides some additional flexibility for these types of entities and growers associated with these entities to conduct research um, on hemp and not have to meet all of the same requirements that a commercial grower would. There are still requirements related to sampling, testing, disposal of non-compliant material and prohibitions on uh, material grown at a research setting from entering into the commercial stream. Our staff is available to talk you through the specific requirements for university research, whether you are a state or tribal government, a land grant university, or an individual interested in partnering with one of these entities to conduct research at your farm. <clears throat> now, one of the most significant differences from the interim final rule has to do with the way that hemp crops are collected from farms and then sent to a laboratory testing facility for uh, THC testing. The final rule now includes a provision known as performance-based sampling. What this means is that instead of having a hard requirement that every single field of hemp and every single hemp producer be sampled and tested throughout the United States. This now gives state and tribal governments the ability to establish performance-based sampling requirements that reflect the specific um, needs and requirements of the growers um, overseen by those individual state or tribal entities. What this means is that state and tribal governments can now utilize data collected in the past, data collected in prior growing seasons, state and regional seed certification programs. They can rely on knowledge from individual growers based on their specific uh, challenges, um, and or compliance issues that they've experienced in the past. And it really gives states and tribes the ability to custom tailor their own sampling requirements based on what will work best for their state and tribe. Just a little more on performance-based sampling. It is not a requirement that states and tribes implement a performance-based sampling scheme in their hemp production plans. It is optional. 
if they elect to not include performance-based requirements in their hemp production plan, they can simply revert back to the hard requirement that all growers be sampled um, and all lots of hemp be sampled. Just a little bit around what did not change from the interim final rule to the final rule. The first item has to do with the requirement that THC testing compliance reflect total THC instead of simply Delta 9 THC. We did not change the 0.3 THC threshold in the final rule simply because USDA does not have the jurisdiction to change this threshold. This was a congressionally mandated figure um, from, from, from Congress. And of course, the only way that this uh, figure can change is through a future congressional action. Additionally, we did not remove the requirement around uh, background checks. There is a requirement that any individual growing hemp under a USDA approved hemp production plan has not had a felony related to a controlled substance in the past 10 years. The way that this is verified is that when a hemp producer applies for their hemp production license, whether from USDA, from a state, or from a tribe, they are required to undergo, undergo a background check. And this is the mechanism we use to uh, prove whether or not this individual has had a felony conviction in the prior 10 years or not. This requirement um, remains in effect. Just a few miscellaneous provisions in the rule that we wanted to mention very quickly. Getting back to the topic of negligent violations, a producer that has more than three, three negligent violations in a five-year period loses their ability to grow hemp. In the interim final rule, we did not specify how many negligent violations a producer could receive in one uh, calendar year or one growing season. So we were running across instances where certain individuals were receiving more than three negligent violations in one year and were subject to a five-year license suspension. We have refined this requirement now to say that a producer can only receive one negligent violation per year or per growing season. So that's uh, an important distinction. Um, we also wanted to clarify some of the requirements going back to, to some of the new flexibilities with disposal. Basically clarifying that law enforcement does not need to be the entity conducting disposal on the farm. It can be uh, completed by the producer and does not need to be supervised by any law enforcement personnel. We wanted to clarify that as it relates to some of the compliance and record keeping requirements, that all records related to individual growing operations or facilities need to be retained by producers for at least three years. And we also wanted to remind viewers that under the requirements of the 2018 Farm Bill, no state or tribe can prohibit the movement of hemp across their state or tribal boundaries. They are still able to prohibit the growing of hemp, but they cannot stop legally produced hemp from crossing across their uh, state or tribal boundary lines. Now we wanted to cover just briefly some of the 
instances and examples of, of areas where USDA has jurisdiction um, and talk about some of the places where USDA is the regulatory body. Uh, USDA receives a lot of questions um, related to this information, so we just wanted to touch on it briefly. USDA has jurisdiction over the production of hemp at the farm level. We have jurisdiction over state governments and their administration of their state level hemp production programs. Additionally, we have oversight over tribal governments and their administration of their uh, tribal hemp programs. USDA does not regulate the manufacturing side of hemp. This means we have no oversight over products such as uh, CBD or other cannabinoid products. Um, we have no oversight over uh, hemp-based food products. We have no, manu uh, no oversight over manufacturers of any of these finished type products. Um, there are different regulatory partners in the federal government that have oversight over different aspects of the hemp industry. The one we wanted to point out is, of course, FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. This is the entity that does have jurisdiction over these food and drug products um, that are made or derived from hemp. That's, that's not USDA. So now we're going to cover some of the requirements that need to be in all state and tribal hemp production plans. When we refer to plans, these are the regulatory documents that are provided to USDA for review. USDA reviews these documents and then either approves or disapproves the um, state or tribal hemp production plan. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the requirements that all of these plans have to include. So all plans have to include items around tracking the land where hemp is grown, procedures for sampling and testing for THC content. They have to include requirements around what um, to do with non-compliant plants and explain how the disposal process works. They all need to have provisions around compliance. They need to have procedures to explain how they will share certain required information with USDA. And lastly, they have to be able to certify that they have the resources in place to administer their local hemp production program. This has to do with um, providing information to USDA around their budget, their available staffing, and their ability to administer their program at the local level. Again, all state and tribal plans must be approved by the USDA. Um, USDA has 60 days to approve or disapprove plans once they are submitted to us. State and tribal hemp plans can be more restrictive than minimum USDA requirements. They cannot be less restrictive. All state and tribe hemp production programs are subject to audit um, for compliance reasons by USDA every three years. Again, states and tribes cannot prohibit the movement of hemp, um, legally produced hemp across their jurisdictions. They're now able to include performance-based sampling protocols and do not have to sample and test every single um, grower and every single lot of hemp if they uh, wish to not. State and travel plans can be updated, revised at any time. The only requirement is that they, the updated version needs to be sent to USDA for a legal review and to work through the approval process, um, again, for the revised plan document. 
And of course, any plans now that will be submitted to USDA need to meet the requirements in the final rule, not the requirements in the interim final rule. All state and tribal hemp production plans need to include requirements for FSA reporting. This is another example of a requirement in the interim final rule that did not change in the final rule. What this means is that regardless of whether a producer is regulated by an individual state, a tribe, or by USDA, all producers need to register the land where they're growing hemp with USDA's Farm Service Agency. The mechanism for working through this reporting process involves visiting with your local FSA county office and providing them information on where you are growing hemp on your farm or on your growing facility, um, whether it's indoors, whether it is a greenhouse, whether it is a hoop house, um, whether you are just growing several plants for per personal consumption, or whether you're growing several thousand acres of, of hemp, all of those producers need to provide the information on where the hemp is being grown to the USDA Farm Service Agency. We have resources on our website to help you understand this process, to help you understand where the nearest Farm Service Agency County office is to your facility. So you will understand what to do and we can make this process as seamless and as, as straightforward as possible. Again, laboratories have now until December 31st, 2022 to register with DEA. In the final rule, we have several other requirements for laboratories testing him for compliance purposes. So I encourage all viewers to take a look, um, especially laboratories, take a look at what those requirements are to be sure that your facilities are aligned with the requirements of the program. An example of one of these requirements has to do with the inclusion of a measurement of uncertainty that is to be reported with all test results coming from labs. This is a fairly technical matter and I would encourage laboratories to refer back to the final rule for more specific instructions. I would also encourage everyone to again refer back to the guideline documents that were issued with the final rule. There is a standalone guideline document for laboratories to talk through specific uh, testing requirements and that is the best place to um, find more information. Again, all laboratories testing hemp need to provide all test results to USDA. This is done using a form which is available on, on our hemp program website. As a quick aside, USDA is also in the midst of developing an extensive IT system that will allow for online submission of all required materials, not only from labs, but from producers, states, and also Indian tribes. When reporting laboratory test results to USDA, we wanted to remind labs that USDA does not need test results for tests conducted throughout the growing season to monitor uh, THC compliance. A lot of times growers will send uh, material out to labs throughout the growing season so they have better information on how the THC concentration of their plants 
are changing throughout the season. USD does not need these test results. What we do need is the final test result that is ultimately used to determine compliance um, and, and whether or not the material has to be remediated, disposed, or is ultimately uh, able to be sold. We also wanted to mention the requirement around sampling agents. Hemp growers are not able to collect their own samples from their farms. Um, they have to utilize other individuals. We refer to these individuals as sampling agents. These are, in, these are folks who have been trained on how to walk through a field, how to walk through a greenhouse, to collect samples from hemp plants, package those materials um, in a sound fashion, and then provide those materials to a laboratory testing facility. It is very important that growers begin to think early in the season about making sure they've uh, procured the services of these sampling agents um, so that come harvest time, there will not be any delays in working through the required sampling and testing exercise that all growers must now conduct. Again, getting back to some of the guideline documents issued with the final rule, there is also a standalone guideline document for sampling requirements. This is the place to refer to if you want to understand more about exactly how samples are collected at a farm, how sampling agents walk through a field and find plants to pull samples from, how the implants are actually cut, where they're cut, what happens with the cutting, um, how that material is combined, how it's sent to a laboratory, all of those requirements are in this sampling guideline document. So I very much encourage everyone to take a look. Just a quick note around timelines. Again, states and tribes are able to, um, forget, excuse me, states, states, not tribes. States are able to continue to administer their 2014 Farm Bill pilot programs out until uh, January 1st, 2022. The final rule formally goes into effect on March uh, 22nd of this year. States and tribes that are eager to amend their existing hemp production program plans or establish new hemp production program plans are encouraged to submit those documents to USDA as quickly as possible. The individuals that I introduced at the very beginning are standing by ready to work with you on helping to understand final, the final rule provisions, working through the review process and getting those updated plans approved and posted to the website as quickly as we can. So this wraps up the webinar. Again, I encourage everyone to, in, to visit our hemp production program website. There you can find information on all aspects of the program, forms, regulatory documents, webinars such as this, FAQs, um, guideline documents for sampling, testing, disposal and remediation and everything available from USDA as it relates to loans, conservation programs, the whole breadth of programs offered by USDA that are available for the hemp, uh, hemp community can be found on that website. So please take a look. If you have questions about any aspect of the program whatsoever, send an email to 
farmbill.hemp at usda.gov. This email inbox is monitored in real time and we will have a response back to you as quickly as we can. We're always available for meetings, for conversations. As we've found over the last two years, every uh, instance of seeking clarification around hemp out there in Indian tribes um, and with states are distinct and different. We find the best way a lot of times to resolve um, some of these issues is through a meeting, through a conversation. So we're always available to hold those with you. My email address personally is also here at the bottom of the page and uh, our, the phone number that you can call to reach any of us at the program um, is, is there below. So we appreciate you joining us and we are eager to um, work with you moving forward in administration of the U.S. Domestic Hemp Production Program. So thank you.